Welcome. My name is Tim Leonard. I'm the Executive Vice President at TMW, a Trimble company. Um, we're going to cover a couple things during this presentation. Uh, I decided actually to modify this presentation a little bit. I apologize. Some of the notes didn't come out earlier. But I added a special guest, Dr. Kumar, who is one of our data science at TMW. So Dr. Kumar is actually going to go through some of the scientific models that were designed as a result of some of the data collection points that we discovered. So I thought that would be a little bit funner to kind of go through versus the, the keynote yesterday and some of the breakouts that we were able to do uh, across the technology platform. So I'm going to welcome Dr. Kumar on stage. And then uh, as we go through some of the slides, uh, you'll see him picking up and walking through some of those models. The thing I want to start highlighting is a couple key points. So I'm going to go through a couple slides fairly quickly because I, I really think the interest of the data model that Dr. Kumar had designed and developed is a great interest for, for people to, to hear and see. But I want to talk about the industry of transportation. It's critical to kind of understand the footprint of where we're at, where we're at today in the industry, but more importantly, some of the business problems that we're solving. When you look at the data, the data that we're collecting across the industry itself, transportation really is, is synonymous with lanes, shipments, rates, driver, payment structures. But here's some external things that we started discovering. So not just with the transportation data, we started looking at what's called external data points, telematics, safety data, uh, things around social media. So our whole focus point was to really look at um, kind of the ecosystem around transportation, not just transportation in itself. The thing that we outputted as a result of that, which you'll see here out of some of the models that Dr. Kumar will present, are more visibilities than ever before inside the industry itself. We have transportation wide sectors. We have the abilities to drive into fuel analysis like we've never had before. We have a, the opportunities to actually lead scoring opportunities for uh, low paying small carriers who never had the opportunities to actually decide whether a particular lane was good for them or not. We also had the abilities to start driving new data driven market areas which were critical to our business and actually had allowed different penetration rates uh, that you'll see. I did want to put this thing up here because I think it's important. We have close to 130 terabytes uh, on our system today, but we're actually analyzing and looking at close to two trillion record sets. There's a petabyte of data that will actually evolve into, and I wanted to highlight one or two things that are, quick, are on here. Certainly driver is an anomaly in the industry today. You hear about the shortage of drivers, driver availability. That's only one one hundredth of the data sets that we actually look at. Orders, commodity, um, order audits, uh, events, GPSs. So when you hear the word telematics, people right away think of, of the transportation. But I, I wanted to show there are so many different data sets and in the, in the, in the amount of data collected within that is, is huge. The other aspect of it is the historical content. A lot of the as is, as was analysis that you'll see in the future slides really was stemming of understanding that it's not a simple problem. I think as you guys and some of the things that have been covered here over the uh, conference have been a, a great realization of what people have been speaking about data value. What is the value of your information itself? So you've seen this in a breakout session as well as the, um, the keynote that I had done yesterday about some of the fragmentations in transportation. I'm not going to go through it a lot, but a couple of highlights I want you to remember is that there is a very little market-wide data that's available to truly look at the industry. Everybody has their own secret sauce. I don't care if they're Walmart, I don't care if they're Walgreens, I don't care if you're J.B. Hunt, Covenant, everybody out there had a secret sauce that they think they could solve the problem. Brokers have the access to the most data points. That's something that we kind of looked at and said, why isn't this data available for everybody? The other thing that we started realizing is, is the discrepancy in the small and mid-sized carriers. TMW has been around for 30 years. They have the abilities to penetrate and look at large data fleets. But what started to come out was the, the daunting deficit of data that's truly available to that. The benefit that I get working at Trimble is I get to look at all different sector, sectors of the industry. I've got agriculture, I've got construction, I have geospacing. So it was a great marriage to team up with Trimble so that I could actually get away from just the word transportation and see if there's an anomalies. The good news is when you look at agriculture, there is some anomalies on small players that are out there that are not benefit. 
Hence the concept that we came up with, with an inter, uh, introduction of what we're calling a community-based structure, the abilities for the community of small carriers to actually act like a large carriers. The benefit of that is, is the business of, of leveling the playing fields. We wanted to break out the data sets, and what Dr. Kumar will illustrate and show is the ability to actually look at certain models that you then could put as a SaaS architect in the Azure environment make it available, and they can get the same type of lane analysis, the same type of fuel analysis as our big players. Now, the, laying, uh, the leveling of the playing fields is critical really for one aspect of it. This last mile argument that's coming up through Amazon or through Uber and other uh, opportunities is that we're, we wanna take that noise away from people. Look, taking the noise away from the people and making this small guy competitive will actually help start driving a little bit more stability around pricing. Pricing and trucking is all over the place. So no matter the fleet, the size of them, that we have one thing and also in common, which does a heavy focus in on lane analysis. And again, I, I wanna to point to Dr. Coomer's, uh, one of his models that he's gonna present, because so I think it's critical to see that if you truly understand the entire big data picture, looking at deadheading, ending up freight coming out of specific cities, fuel cost, uh, tire management, maintenance management. We collect everything around that, and I think it's got a good, clear picture for you. Again, going back to the keynote yesterday, leveling the playing field was critical. Looking at the sets of data that we had, making it available, focusing on some of the average rates, the number of loads, associations of fuel shortage that are out there. Um, but better yet, what does this enable? And the thing message I, I kept heading back to is, I'm not in the business of this disruption concept. I'm in the business of the evolution of the data that you have and then the revolution of things that we never thought of. And I think we got some revolutionary ideas that are out there. Um, certainly it, it was a great talking point yesterday on some of the uh, HDFS and some of the Spark streaming ones that I taught on Spark streaming. So when you're looking at these Spark streaming mechanisms with the ingestion of NiFi, that really ties the picture together. We were able to react faster um, with some of our customer base, customer bases that were getting feeds out of the knock. So the NIFI implementation really empowered us to grab the information, ingest it, pass it into Spark Streaming. Spark Streaming then fed it into our H-based structure itself. So I had a lot of questions around that, and, and there's some more white papers that are out there around that whole technical process. So I want to make sure that we covered that for a little bit. Um, and I want to highlight a couple areas around the, the multi-tenant structure. So why did we go to the multi-tenant capability? As we're looking at the small carrier structures, um, we knew that if there was not an easy location, mobile capability, that the abilities for the, the flexibilities of the small carriers to have ingestions, we were not going to succeed. A lot of our stuff in TMW was on-prem structure. The abilities to get your stuff on-prem, that is now going away. So we loaded a lot of our environments up into the Azure cloud with a team of Microsoft. What I don't show here, I think it's a missed point that I didn't do yesterday, is we have a very large private NOC cloud structure. So we actually marry the Azure environment back into our private cloud and actually have both the NIFI components on both containers operating on both sides. TMW customers were enabled not only with the big data, but here's the thing, is, is the models of our data science, uh, we have a very large data, uh, data science organization, our goal was to build that up, to actually build a good model system and actually design models as a SaaS, as a service. So the modelings that the small carriers didn't have to run out and hire data science, they could take advantage of some of our repeatability models that you're gonna see here. The other thing that I really liked that, that came out of it was our business intelligence and data science provided solutions, not only for the customers, but we gave back to the industry. Giving back to the industry, we talked, to, I, there was a speech yesterday at a keynote where profitability, profitability, profitability. I, I get the concept of making money is extremely important, but we at TMW as Trimble believe in the, the, the industry giving back to the community. So we have given back certain pieces of code structures, uh, opportunities within simple dashboards that you can make available for, for Microsoft Power BI. That goes back to, it, it, it's not just an evolution of what you're doing, it's what can you change in the industry that makes your so solution so attractable. So the industry solution and giving back was one of our key components. 
Here's a couple highlights, and I covered this in my technical class yesterday about the Spark system. We are using Spark TO uh, 2.0. Uh, the NIFI is actually a 1.1, uh, that component um, in terms of the ingestions into Spark streaming. I did not highlight the Spark machine learning libraries that are currently available, but the machine Spark uh, learning libraries were, have been a great benefit for us. Um, we are using, utilizing Atlas quite a bit. Um, this goes back to our governance structures and our tying out on some of the operational controls, as well as some of the data stewardship programs that we have. We did wrap this up in a heavy security base. So when you look at Knox Ranger, the abilities to actually have data that is, it is a separation, it is a tenant uh, capabilities. I got to work with George, if you saw the demo yesterday of the trucking, the, the demo of that came from us uh, at, at TMW to supply George, how do you break out a multi-tenant security model structure, keep it separated, so had a great team work with Hortonworks. Um, the white paper actually goes out on that website. I know that uh, Dr. Kumar has been working on some of that, so I'll look forward to that white paper that comes out. Uh, building the transportation community. So as you look at the community itself, the one highlight I wanna go through is the TMW has enabled and leveraged the data science organization with statistical approaches for the marketing intelligence for the profile and cleansing. Why is that important? We give an illustration about when you look at a geo coordinates, for example, of a Walmart distribution center in Pennsylvania. So we have about, um, I'm gonna give you a, a small set set. We took about 900 customer databases that are out there. We have thousands of customer databases. We did a correlation with inside of our data lake. Of those 900 customers, 452 of them hit this one distribution center on a regular basis. Of the 452, 178 of those customers had all the wrong geospacing and coordinates all completely wrong. Not only that, 152 of them had the word, and I believe it or not, different spellings of that location for Walmart. So one of the things that we discovered is if we're gonna make this community strong, we're gonna make it viable, we have to come up with a good cleansing capability. So that's where our master data management program that's actually tied into the data lake has taken off extremely well. We now provide what's called the golden saucer of the record for location, company, and more importantly for freight. So those are the new commodities that we've, we've built as well as the structure. So I would like welcome to stage um, Dr. Kumar. Uh, I wanna just quickly, Dr. Kumar resides in te our Texas office at TMW. Uh, Trimble has a phenomenal office that's there brand new. Um, Dr. Kumar is one of our data science, um, but he's gonna walk through several of these models and uh, hopefully you guys will appreciate that. I have a lot of questions for our data science organization, so I, I thought I'd present one of our scientists. So Dr. Kumar. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, morning, everyone. Uh, so great conference so far, right? Um, whose head spins looking at the pace of change and the technical jargon that's coming at you in the last two days? Mine certainly does. So hopefully in the next few slides, I can walk you through uh, uh, TMW's journey on data science and how we try to step into uh, the, uh, the data, the transportation data, and how we try to provide value or how we thought we could provide value to our customers and the mom and pop shops that, uh, that uh, Tim talked about. So let's start with the, the first thing we tried to look at was market rate index. So what is the most important thing to a carrier, right? How, how do they make their money? They make their money by doing rate per miles. They're looking at their rates that they can get every mile. So we tried to kind of break down um, what kind of visualizations would tell you a story about how the market itself is distributed. So who here is familiar with the, the trailers? So there's the trucks and then there's the trailers, right? So we have three different types of trailers. All that's a little hard to see. What we have is the red is flatbed, the green is refrigerated, and the blue is van. So flatbed generally deals with uh, loads that cannot fit into a container. So you have you know, missiles, you have construction equipment, et cetera, that needs to be transported. I mean, who has seen a house go down the highway <laughs> with a couple of uh, people telling them to get out of the way? Uh, then you have, of course, refrigerated. That, that deals with agriculture products because now if you walk into Whole Foods, you see fruits from Argentina. You have uh, uh, frozen foods. I mean, there's, there's three aisles of frozen foods, which were never present before. So that, that uh, refrigerated uh, vans account for, or rather responsible for, bringing that food to us. Then van, of course, is you know, um, anything containerized. 
Now, why, why is it important to look at these distinctions, right? So, uh, because we cannot make predictions on everything, right? So th this uh, tells you a story about what the distribution of these different types of trailers are. So you can see here that it has a really short, I mean, it starts really, really fast. That means majority of the loads are being done around 300 miles. Between 200 and 300 miles, that accounts for majority of your van. Uh, ref uh, refrigerated, not so much. Uh, about the same thing for flatbed. But notice the tail, right? The tail for van and flatbed is really thin compared to refrigerated. What does that tell you? That tells you that refrigerated trucks are, drive a lot longer distances compared to the other two. That, so how does that help us segment the market, right? You don't want to, if you're a trucking company, you don't want to compare yourself if you're doing van around 200 to 400 miles. You don't want to compare yourself or model your behavior against somebody who's doing refrigerated. You don't want to go after loads, van loads that are doing 1,000 miles because there's, there's not just enough of them to go after. So either it allows you to form a niche for yourself or it allows you to understand where you need to go towards, where are the majority of the loads available, right? So that's, that's, that's the loaded miles distribution of, uh, of our trailers. Now we talk about data cleansing, of course. I mean, the, 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 the old adage about 80% of uh, time uh, you know, to clean data is actually correct. Because if you look here, uh, this is the number of uh, errors. Uh, so there's a pie chart about the error distribution of the market rate index data. So as you can see here, 50, only 55% of the data had no error. So if you pull in data, and this is aggregated data, this is not even stop level data. We're talking about aggregated data that, we, that our data architects looked at and put together. And even then, you're looking at only 55% accuracy or complete accuracy. Then you have about 30% uh, of the data that has at least one error. And that doesn't mean it's the same error throughout. That just means it's a single error. And what, is, what do you mean by error, right? So error t deals with outliers. So if you're looking at, if you see an order which says, oh, it's 100 mile, uh, it, it went 100 miles, but it's charged, it charged you $1,000 a mile. So whoever the poor schmuck is who paid $1,000 a mile, that's not normal. So either it's a data entry error or uh, somebody just you know, is out of a lot of money. Then as we go on further, you see more and more errors occur in the same order. I mean, it goes as, a, as high as up to 30. I mean, the whole order was probably, I, somebody let their baby enter the data for that load. <laughs> At least that's what, uh, uh, that's what my code looks like. So, so this, this gives you an indication of how much data you can you actually use. Now, why is this important, right? Why, why, why do we need to look at the accuracy of the data? That means whenever we are making models, whenever we're building a prediction model, we only have 55% of the data. That means even if we have two petabytes of data, we can only use one petabyte. That means if we are able to gain, at, if we are able to even fix up to two to three errors, we are still pulling in 25% more data. That means our whole predictions, our more models, become 35% more robust, right? And what that does is it also allows us to tell the carrier, hey, this is where your, this is where your data entry is incorrect. And if your data entry is incorrect, how can you run a business when your whole data that you're looking at is incorrect? So it, it points to the consumer that for you to improve your business, the first thing you need to do is improve your data. So that allow, and, and it also helps us point where the problem is, because you have different categories of those of this problems. So that's, uh, that's just to do with uh, data quality, I suppose. Next thing we looked at is uh, fuel data analysis. So we, we should get questions like, why does Expert Fuel? So Expert Fuel is our fuel optimization software for TMW that we provide to our customers. So the question became, why, why do we need to buy fuel optimization? I mean, what, uh, I, can, I can go fill up anywhere and be okay. What we try to show them here is that the fuel prices always vary, no matter what, across states, across the whole timeline, across the whole geography. So this is representing so this is showing a timeline from 2008 onwards. 
So of course we have some missing data. You know, nothing's perfect. And uh, but you can see here, this is the crash, the, the fuel crash. So you can see it kind of really slid down and then went up and over and over. So this represents um, the different fuel points geographically. And the red line here represents uh, the fuel variation itself on a single day. So we can see when the fuel, when the fuel prices crashed across the US, there was actually an uptick in the variation of fuel prices uh, between locations. Uh, or rather not locations, but yeah, over a day. So, but we can see there's always variation. The variation never goes away. That means you absolutely need to make a decision on where to fuel so that you can save money on it, right? So, so this, this kind of gave us an indication, or this helped us provide evidence to, the, to our customers that, hey, you can always save money no matter what. There's a good white paper off of this. Uh, if you guys go to TMW Systems, you'll probably find it there. Um, then we talked about clustering, right? So we, we heard a lot about K-means clustering. Um, what we found in our experience was it's not quite, that's not quite the whole story, right? Because, you can, because we did uh, clustering on uh, just the loaded miles. So we tried to see, okay, how are loaded miles divided? Now, in the industry, a business analyst or a business person will look at his data and say, okay, I'm just gonna look at a nice round number and say 100 to 200 miles. That's the segment I'm gonna look at. Or I'll say, I'm gonna look at 300 to 500 miles because that's where I expect to get a uniform rate. But that's not really true. Because when we did uh, K-means, we applied K-means clustering on loaded miles, what we found was it was anything but nice and rounded. We found the segments were like zero to 333, 333 to 721, 721 to 1157. Now those are not numbers you can, uh, a, a person can normally you know, wrap their heads around. They're going to just want to round it out. I mean, even our own business analysts try to do that. <laughs> but then we tried to think, uh, I looked at the distribution of rate per mile given the segmentation of loaded miles. And it's anything but uniform again. There's absolutely no correlation between a segmentation of loaded miles with the rate per mile. For any distribution of rate per mile, the loaded, the, the, or any distribution of loaded miles, the rates were completely all over the place. So then, I, then we started thinking, okay, what can we do differently? Like how, how else can you look at it, right? So that's when we came to contour plot. So the area that's really dark, that means there's not as much activity there. The area that's really light, that tells you how hot that segment is, right? So this, this, this allows you to identify what the islands are. So what you're looking at is an island, right? So these are the hot spots. So these are the sweet spots that gives you the maximum number of load availability. So as a carrier, where do you wanna go, right? So if you're in this area, all your trucks are kinda doing these loads, which direction do you wanna go in? Like where do you wanna end up? Where, 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 do, where do you think you will get the maximum load availability so that you don't have to deadhead to go different places and lose a lot of money just driving empty miles? Right? And, then be, and then go to your customer and say, oh, I'm gonna charge you twice because I was deadheading here. That doesn't really work because there's so much competition, somebody's always gonna beat you. So what, what, what gives you that competitive edge? This will tell you which direction to go in. So if you're over here, you wanna try to move towards this direction. If you're over here, you wanna move towards this direction. And even if you don't wanna move towards this direction, right, how do you identify what your niche is? How do you, how do you tell your customer, hey, I'm the only one who operates here, I'm the one I'm the best one you can, that can give you this right. So this allows the customer themselves to go to a shipper, a carrier themselves to go to a shipper and say, hey, you know, this is the distribution. Let's talk about it. So, so this is something that we came across, which was pretty interesting. Um, model building, right? So um, now the next question becomes, wh what does it take for a carrier to run their business efficiently? Right? How, how do you plan your network? What, 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 um, I mean, there, there are innumerable number of factors, right? But what are, what are the few important ones that we can focus on that we can build our models as accurate as, as accurate as possible, which would give a competitive edge to a small carrier? Now, not everybody has the cap capacity to hire PhD level guys and put them to build their models on their own, uh, on their own carriers, right? Because 97% of the carriers only have 20 trucks or less. 
they don't have the capacity to put data science at work. So what we decided to focus on was build models to predict rate per mile, load availability over different times across the United States, and load velocity. Now, it's interesting because uh, when I first joined, I started writing optimization algorithms. Uh, I asked the analysts, so you know, what's, the, what's the average speed do you use? What speed do you say that this load is going to be delivered at? How do you calculate your ETA? Oh, it's an average 65 miles an hour, <laughs> right? So they just average it out. But that's not really true because when I was doing this uh, analysis on load velocity, the, the fastest you could get between the pickup and the drop off was 55 miles an hour. That was the majority of the speed you were gonna get. And yet, they were putting 65 miles an hour as a driving speed, and they used that to calculate the ETA. Which is not correct, because there are so many confounding factors, like you have uh, load times, unload times. Right? Whether it's a live loading, or you're just dropping off the tra uh, trailer and going on your way. So, and then you have weather. You cannot predict weather. I mean, the weather from last year which will, will not be the same as today. Uh, you have traffic. The traffic might change. So we figured that building load velocity from point to point, zip code to zip code, would give you the best indication of which load to pick up and which not to. Because that will allow you to more realistically calculate what your ETA is going to be across the network. Because uh, I mean, anybody who's studied network graphing will understand that uh, any delay or any tolerance that you build into your network only leads to more inefficiency. So you say, okay, I'm gonna get there 65 miles an hour, I'll be there tomorrow. But that's not necessarily the case because some, there's gonna be a slowdown. So when you get there, you're late. And you've already scheduled your next load and then it just keeps propagating. So before you know it, you're really late. So, so we figured, we realized that this is probably a very important piece of the puzzle that that, that uh, it's hard to calculate. It's because we are doing these calculations on every day. We're doing these calculations on zip codes across the timeline. And this is not the granularity that anybody looks at. It's really hard to fit. I mean, I don't know if anybody has read the article about uh, the human mind, human mind able to think in 11 dimensions, right? 11 dimensions, that's crazy. Because you can't even, we can't even see for the fourth dimension. And yet, this data is across the timeline every day over a variety of different zip codes. I mean, there are about 7,000 zip codes. So, and, and then you combine the, you do the combinations of it, it just goes out of control really fast. So, so these are the models that we built. Um, then how do you use them, right? So you don't need all the information all the time. So the natural extension of that is you provide it as a service. You tell us what your network is, we'll give you the necessary predictions that you need to use to run your business. So that, we realized, would be a great uh, value addition to the, to the consumer. But again, that's not the end of the story. <laughs> because this is the transformation data lake for the entire industry. Right? Now the question is, the, the absence of information is also an experience. Right? If, if you cannot look at all the data, you, 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 don't, you don't want to throw all the data at a person because you'll easily get overwhelmed. I mean, the last three days of the conference easily showed, showed you that. So how do you mask information that is not important? And how do you display information that is important to a network planner? So in this scenario, what we tried to do was we tried to build a relationship graph between different points in the network. So the more intensity you see here between two different nodes, the more rate per mile you'll get. And this is just one day. You're looking at a single date, and this changes wildly every day. Yes. Yep. And the load availability is shown as uh, the size of the circle. Yes, but, but, but this is not showing you the number of trucks that are going there. Yeah, so, this is not so, showing you the competition there. 
So what we have here is, is, a, is an example, and, and if you were to select down one, we wanted the people to see that, that the capture of the entire industry is, is, is there for, for TMW and Trimble. But more importantly is, to your point, uh, and we don't, can't put it all up here, but we have layers of that, what trucks are available, what's, what's in the maintenance bays. So this is just a simple representation of hot spots that we have, and then and the button's not really shown, what you can do is just start clicking out trucks available, um, fuel consumption, fuel cost. Um, so the whole category on the left enables you to start, and that's what we come up with what's called wide table analytics. So what we said was underneath this thing um, was the abilities to look at your data, and we just, we didn't show all North America, but you actually could bring up all North America, United States. Um, you can come down in here, and the wide table analytics is not dimensional. You can actually just start asking it questions. You know, tell me the trucks, tell me the layer of the fuel, tell me what's hot right now, what's deadheading, what's not deadheading. And the last thing is, instead of creating a time dimension on here, time is embedded on every question. So whether, instead of saying, I'm gonna ask the question of the fuel and then dimensionalize it with time, we just say, keep asking it any scenario you want. So this actually runs in, in near real time, and you'll just see this thing flashing up on the visualization. We, we don't call it a BI visualization, it's a data visualization. It's to tell you on our wide table analytics and some of our wide table analytic table structures are close to 700 um, columns itself, but that's all cached in memory. And you just start putting you know, a nice good graphical piece that you see on here, but to your point, you wanna, I, I only wanna see fuel. I only wanna see what's deadheading come out of later. Okay, I can come into that zip code Dr. Kumar had a great point, is that the zip codes themselves around Atlanta, you know, you got nine, 10 different zip codes that are coming in on there. In the past, you really only looked at a city. Okay, I'm gonna go into Atlanta. Am I deadheading out of city? One of our uh, other data scientists, he lives in New Mexico, discovered a pattern of zip code analysis. He actually found in a directional zip coding off this data lake, if you're coming from a specific zip code, from the west, and you're this size of a carrier, 82% of their deadheads were coming out of Atlanta. So now he could flip it and go, what size carrier are you? Versus the question is, an old question in trucking was, am I gonna deadhead coming out of Atlanta? That wasn't enough. Now we can go zip code deadheading, directional deadheading, size of the fleet deadheading, and here's the last one we're discovering, where they're stopping at the fuel areas. The fuel areas are actually giving us indicators at the last stop of fuel that they're gonna, they're, they're, their majorities are deadheading on a certain fuel point. You can predict that they're a deadhead based on their fuel. Yep. That is game changer. So you could, you could give them a pretty low offer, frankly, fuel time. You got it. So not only can we catch them in motion, here's the key, and this is what George and I discovered. And, George did a great job. I don't know who's here for his keynote. Uh, for most of you guys who are keynote, he brought up that trucking company that thinks he was doing, that, that was our stuff. We can now, in motion, most people have to wait for it to happen. We can actually alert it and actually go, okay, but you're at this fuel stop point. When you're going into this direction, your, your, your chances of that thing deadheading motion from that fuel point into another de or location for a zip code drop off. Why is that so important is the last mile. When you start getting into uh, fleet distribution, which Amazon's trying to solve, the problem is TMW has so much density. The key in the carrier piece is, is not the capacity, it's the density of, of what you're monitoring. So what you're seeing up here um, is close to, and I won't, I'll give you the rough numbers so, so that I won't get in too much trouble, but right now inside of the data lake itself, you're looking at probably close to 1.7 million cabs. Um, you're looking at probably close to 2 million trailers that are out there in North America, in the United States, and in Mexico. So it's the density that enables us to drive down into some of the great work Dr. Kumar and his team have done on building this thing out. So, I, you know, one of the things I would have loved to actually drill in more, but the white paper, once you see it comes out here, you'll see this type of graph, and then the filtering layers over the wide table analytics. We believe the world of um, some of the designs around our business intelligence teams, uh, around star schema design, uh, snowflakes, all that goes away. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we're releasing is the evidence to show you, you don't need to do data marts anymore. You don't need to build them out. The white table analytic structures 
or actually a replacement. I had a great discussion with, Dr. Or with uh, Ralph Kimball about wide table replacing a, a uh, data mark configuration. And then more importantly, a snowflake or a star schema all goes away. Fax tables are embedded in a wide table analytics. That's what you see up here. That's all being driven off of that. We, we, do, we, don't, we don't think that uh, the capabilities around that. Okay, so I'm gonna, got the hand signal real quick. Um, so what went right? Um, building a data lake, working with Hadoop and Azure, this did allow us to get into a little bit more design aspects for mobility pieces, uh, as well as the abilities to drive out other technical solutions. You heard us talk about the cleansing around our master data management. And I go back to benchmarking is so critical in the transportation world. Um, where our analysis is driving into filter areas, design areas we've never seen before. Um, you know, one of the experts of the Horton with uh, George and his team was, was teach, teach, teach. So by teaching our teams, we've expanded new avenues in terms of coming up with new dimensional models. Um, speed to market, TMW, nine months. Design, build, first customer on there, and our customers, our, our small carriers or median carriers are loving it. Um, being agile, adopting certain structures that are out place today. We were a big NIFI um, adopter, as well as some of the sparks that came out. Um, so we had a great opportunity to team up with Horton Works and actually do some uh, great adventurous work with George and his team. So we had a great time doing that. So I am now going to open it up for questions because I got the hand signal. So I wanted to leave at least four or five minutes for questions on there, three minutes for questions. So any hot questions that you guys had as a result of what you saw today? None. Good, different from my meeting yesterday, so great. Uh, just a quick question when you were doing the data cleansing and you showed all the different errors that were there. Um, do you get a lot of false positives? I mean, how do you assess out, do you, are they real, really errors and, and, and everything else goes with it? The errors we're talking about is uh, outliers. So at least on numerical columns, we have outliers, and then we have our business analysts define what, the, what combination of string columns are not necessary, right? So for, instead of having flat bird vans, somebody just put in, somebody just put AA. That doesn't make any sense in terms of equipment. So we took those out. So those were considered incorrect entries. Then uh, numerical column-wise, like we talked about rate per mile, if it's wildly out of context, right? So if it's $100 per mile, that just does not make sense. And even if somebody paid that, this is a one-off case. So it cannot be part of the model. Yep. So those were the errors we talked about. Okay, so I'll get the final hand signal. Um, so thank you guys for joining on behalf of Dr. Kumar and myself. Thank you guys for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you.